Welcome to our YouTube channel where wisdom meets inspiration. In this channel, we share valuable insights to help you become the best version of yourself. Our content is designed to uplift your spirit and enrich your life. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to stay connected with this incredible journey. Click the subscribe button below. Acharya Upasanam It means service to the teacher. Well, first and foremost, Vedanta is a knowledge system. It is therefore transmitted through texts and teachers. So the role of the teacher, the guru, the acharya is very important here, central. We may think, why this unnecessary reverence to the guru? In um, Hinduism, the guru is held in very high esteem. And to almost the same extent in, uh, in other Indian traditions of Buddhism and Jainism also. Sikhism, of course, very important. Why? Well, one practical reason is I have noticed if I have a lot of reverence in the Guru, then the teachings of the Guru take um, root easily. I am very attentive. When I have a great deal of reverence to the Guru and the teachings, I am very attentive when the Guru is teaching. Otherwise, if I treat him just like uh, any other um, instructor or classroom teacher, I'm sometimes listening, sometimes I'm attending to my thoughts, own thoughts going on there. My attitude to the whole teaching will be changed by my attitude to the teacher. Personal contact with the teacher. Upasana means to sit near. Asana, sit. Upa, close. Personal contact with the teacher takes on a big uh, relevance in this day of AI. And computer-based learning, online learning and all that. So how much, how important is personal contact with the teacher? This was from Plato. He says that knowledge cannot be transmitted. And therefore, personal contact with the teacher is important. This sounds counterintuitive. He says, you can't pour your knowledge into somebody else. You can only help the knowledge to arise in the mind of the student. See, those who have done education, studied school teaching and education, pedagogy, they know this is the cutting edge theory today of pedagogy, of teaching, teaching learning. It's called constructivism. Constructivism means knowledge is a construct which arises in the mind of the student. It's not the information that I pour into the student. The earlier method, old method of education was tabula rasa, blank slate. The student's mind is a blank slate and the teacher comes and pours all the wisdom of the ages into the student's mind. It never works like that. Same teacher, same teaching, same classroom. One student in the classroom will understand in one way, the other one will understand in another way, the third one will not understand at all. So the difference is in the mind of the student, not so much in the teaching, nor in the teacher. And Plato says, it is because of this personal contact with the teacher is necessary. Because the knowledge has to arise. If knowledge could be poured, book is enough, online teaching is enough, um, virtual teacher is enough, AI is enough. Hmm? So one uh, student in a computer science department, they generated Sarva Priyan in the AI and demonstrated to me also. Very good. Uh, better than me if you ask any question. Yeah. I asked a few questions to the AI. Not only it gave good answers, but also pointed, I can't cut it down because it pointed out, you said this in this talk at this moment. It has got access to 1000 hours of my talks. Plus all the encyclopedias and you know all the philosophy books of the world. So if you ask a question, it puts together all of that and gives you the answer. Very good. I can't match it. But it's not enough. Personal contact with the teacher is, is required. Upasana, to be near the teacher. Plato says, why this personal contact is required? Because knowledge cannot be poured into the student, like pouring from one cup to another cup. You cannot do it. It must arise in the student. Therefore, he says, personal presence of the teacher and a relation teach, relationship with the teacher. The student should find the teacher beloved, my beloved Socrates. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Parampara. So Plato, my beloved Socrates, I love and revere my teacher so much. When I love and revere my teacher so much, then I will love and revere that knowledge also, the teaching also. 
enabling its arising in my mind. I remember a monk told me that when he was a um, trainee monk, he was t telling me of the monks who taught him, very revered senior swamis, some of whom had passed away by the time I became a monk. He said, you know, he was telling me because I was uh, asked to teach the young monks uh, in the training center. So he was telling that to as a caution and as an inspiration to me. He said, when we looked at our acharyas, our masters who taught us, and we looked at their lives, we thought, wow, you can be like that if you learn Vedanta and practice Vedanta. And I also want to learn Vedanta and practice Vedanta because I want to be like that. A young Dutch boy who became a monk later on, I said, how did your boy from Netherlands become a monk? He said, I didn't know anything about Vedanta, but I saw Swami Ranganathanandaji, who was the 13th president of our order. And I saw this is a lion among men. I want to be like that. Then I became interested in his Vedanta. Before that, I had no interest, but I want to be like that. So the presence of the teacher and a loving, reverential relationship with the teacher, this is Plato. He's saying this is a core factor in education. Um, Acharya Upasanam. But let's go deeper. Upasana means to worship, but it means to sit near. So that's why when we worship the do the puja, we also mean upasana, but we are sitting near God. I have put my asana near the near God. Um, in Vedanta, it means not physical, not just physical closeness with the teacher. That is, of course, good. It's required. It means um, all right, let me just, physical closeness, one more thing, uh, let me just add. I, I remembered this. I got a chance to study for a few months at the Harvard Divinity School a few years ago. One of the teachers, I, I used to go around looking for good teachers. So two, uh, my criteria were two, what I did there. One was subjects which I'm interested in, Indian philosophy, Buddhism, Vedanta, whatever was available, um, psychology. I would go there. And the second thing I was looking for is good teachers. Because it's a, it's a saying, it's a pleasure to listen to an expert talking about their subject. You may not be so much interested in a subject, but an expert who loves that subject. After all, the fault is not in the subject, it's in me. I have not developed the taste. But somebody who has developed the taste, who loves the subject, when that person talks, you also feel excited. So I would go to these, and I would ask the students. The students know who the good teachers are. So one teacher was there. I don't, I mean, he must be still there. He is the senior most teacher in the philosophy department, William Goldfarb. He is one of the world's leading experts on Wittgenstein. It's a very advanced class. I mean, it's something that I was totally not qualified for. But I love Wittgenstein. And I thought this teacher also must be great. I've heard so much about him. So I went and said to him, you must have been surprised to see a monk suddenly pop up in the uh, Wittgenstein class. And But he was very nice to me. He said, uh, I said, I don't think I'll be able to understand this, but can I... Um, attend your class. He said, yes, Swami, come, sit, listen. So I would come and sit and listen. And he, most of the teachers nowadays, I realized in my time at the university, it's all online. So they had their own um, web pages uh, in the university portal where the handouts are there, examination dates are there, results are given, uh, there are discussion boards. It's A lot of it is online, except this teacher. Most of his page is empty. There's nothing, not much is there. He's old fashioned. He's been at Harvard for 50 years as a student, as a young lecturer, as a professor, and as now he's the senior most. So he said, no, come to class, sit here, look at me, listen. You will understand. Especially if something is very subtle and very difficult, you listen. Physical proximity and attention to the teacher. Now, let's go deeper. As I was saying, sitting near is one thing. That's, of course, as I said, all of this is because of the sitting near, upasana. But in Vedanta, it means something else. It means, upasana literally means sitting where the teacher is sitting. Not just physically sitting on the asana. I, we are sitting in Jagat, in the world, in samsara. The teacher is sitting in Brahman. So, Vivekananda said, stand on the Atman. Does not mean you use the Atman as a mat. It means, where do you locate yourself? Where is the teacher locating himself? In Atman, in Brahman. Sit where the teacher is sitting. 
it's a it's like almost like a physical force i remember i used to feel this sometimes with swami bhuteshananda ji when i would see him the 12th president of our order and there's a term called holy jealousy when you see this spiritual jealousy when you see the spiritual elevation of this person the radiance of light and peace and wisdom you feel i want some of that i am jealous of that where is he sitting i want to sit there that is upasana and vedanta helps you to sit where the teacher is sitting acharya upasana the deeper meaning of acharya upasana yes of course physical proximity contact with the teacher which is transferred which is uh, expressed in of course literally means service to the teacher so you stay with the teacher and give service to the teacher and the teacher transmits knowledge but the deeper meaning is you sit near the teacher where the teacher is sitting don't push the teacher away from his seat and go and sit there acharya upasanam become swami vivekanandas messenger share the video with three of your friends